Fantastic. Okay. So we prepared a little presentation. I hope that the you guys can see this. Yes. Great. All right. So we organized this carbon webinar fest, and we are now on our third uh, webinar. This one got a lot of attention, and I also am personally very interested in this topic. It's called Beyond Carbon, Diver Diverse Credits for Landscape Restoration. Um, and our two previous webinars, they were a little bit more technical about uh, soil monitoring and the continuous monitoring of uh, soil carbon monitoring and the continuous monitoring of cook stoves. So um, yeah, I think this one's gonna be maybe a little bit more juicy. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe from, from Common Land's perspective, I'm gonna, just say a little bit what our aim for this session is. And that is essentially to get an overview of the recent developments in the sphere of biodiversity and wildlife credits, and to draw from the experience and knowledge of four organizations or experts here who have a little bit of, um, or a lot of experience in this field. And um, yeah, just to get a little bit for everyone in the, in the webinar to get an understanding of why this is relevant, uh, and interesting for common land. So just briefly, uh, common land is a non-for-profit system developer of large scale landscape restoration projects. We are based in the Netherlands. And in a nutshell, what we do is that we connect and support landscape partners in making their landscape and community healthy over time. And we do this using a the four returns approach. So we try to do this, or we do this holist holistically using the four returns approach. And I won't go into the details of what the four returns approach is, uh, that would take too much time, but we do have a website and a learning platform that you can check out. So, and there also we have a four returns uh, guidebook. And if you go on our website, you can find all of that. And you can also learn more about uh, yeah, the four returns framework. And um, yeah, and as we already mentioned in some of our previous webinars this week, one way that we support landscape restoration is by working with partners in developing carbon projects and bringing natural, financial, social, and inspirational benefits or returns to local communities. And these benefits, specifically financial benefits, are not for profit. So they go, or they're given directly to the communities um, for development projects. And at the moment, we focus mostly on carbon projects, but we are actually interesting, interested in diversifying our methods and uh, yeah, seeing whether biodiversity and wildlife is really something that we can monitor something, uh, whether this biodiversity and wildlife credits is something that is worthwhile investing in and what the process of producing such credits is. Um, so if you haven't gathered so far, we're probably going to focus mostly on biodiversity and wildlife credits today. And yeah, and how they can overlap also with carbon credits to produce multiple re revenue streams for uh, landscapes and local communities. So um, this is what why it's interesting for Common Land. And Isham, who's head of carbon for uh, of Common Land, decided to invite uh, our speakers today, which is, are, is David from the Conservation Finance Alliance, Tim from Replanet, Mariana, who we're still waiting for, uh, from Terrasos, and then Richard from uh, WWF Namibia. And uh, before we let you guys uh, present your, your, your presentations and present new work, Isham came up to me this morning and said, but Melena, before that, I also want to give <laughs> a little bit of a... a a more a global sort of a, a more context to uh, the state of biodiversity globally. So I told Isham he is allowed to do that and go ahead and just explain everyone why what the state of biodiversity is right. currently. Uh, this is just the session flow for today, but we'll go straight into it. So thank you very much, Melena. Hello, Tim, David, and Richard, and everybody watching. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of background on the state of biodiversity worldwide. And for this, I've used the Living Planet Index. It's an index uh, measured by the Zoological Society of London and the United Nations Environmental uh, Programme uh, for 
the World Wide Fund for Nature, WWF, and it's published uh, uh, once in two years. So as you can see in this graph, um, the uh, state of biodiversity has been declining quite substantially in the last 50 years. And overall, there, there has been a decline of, um, now I see, can see the number of 69%, which is, uh, is quite uh, substantial, I must say. However, I wanted to uh, go a little bit deeper into this indicator. And as we can see from this graph, uh, it's it's uh, th this global living planet index. It does not give uh, an entire picture because there, there are uh, differences in biodiversity decline uh, between regions. And we can see the, the largest declines are in the global south uh, with the biggest devastation in Latin America and the Caribbean with a decline in biodiversity of 94%. Uh, closely followed by Africa, 66%, and then Asia and Pacific, 50, uh, 55, uh, 55%. So, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, pretty much a disaster, I would say, if we look at uh, these results. Uh, but uh, I, for me, it's important to still... Um, make a side note on, on something else. So actually, even if we see this devastation, there's still a miracle that has happened on planet Earth in the last 200 years. Um, so biodiversity has, going, has gone down through, um, but um, large areas of the world have seen a, a miraculous development, an, an improvement of living standards, pulling many people out of misery and poverty. And even if there is a, a large improvement, uh, still a lot of uh, countries need to follow. Uh, a lot of, uh, lots of people are still poor um, and human progress still needs to continue. However, of, obviously this uh, will come with a, a potential cost uh, for nature. So that's why it's important to balance these things out. And uh, we need to find a balance between human civilization and nature. So we want to further focus on future progress for humans. And this is protection from the dark side of nature that lots of people forget. Uh, we need to protect ourselves and people from cold, heat, storms, famine, disease, etc., and at the same time benefit from nature, uh, agricultural, natural resource management, etc. However, this needs to be balanced out with enough space for non-human nature to thrive uh, and to protect it from destructive human behavior, but also potentially benefit from our behavior with sustainable land use and resource management. So uh, I just wanted to share this uh, because I don't want to just picture a very dark image. So we just have uh, things that are going well, other things that are not going well, and we need to balance them out. And, and with this, I would like to uh, open the, the presentations um, and, and hear about biodiversity credits and wildlife credits, which we think is has a huge potential next to the voluntary carbon market. It's a space that is emerging now. And Commonland is very interested in participating in this space. So we are all here now to learn from the experts that we've invited. So uh, I would like to give the word first to David of the Conservation Finance uh, Alliance uh, for uh, his presentation. Thank you, Sham. That was a lot of food for thought. Um, David, can you share your presentation? Yes, let's see. Tell me if I've, I've got the right screen here. Um, yes. Yeah, we can see it. Full screen, is that right? Yep. Great, okay. Well, um, hello everyone. And um, you know, thank you so much to Common Land for, for inviting us to uh, be part of this uh, really great panel. Um, and uh, you know, you have some of the, uh, the the front runners and innovators here in, in nature credits uh, on this uh, on this webinar. So, so you're in for a treat. I'm going to give just a quick overview of of the nature credit space. It is rapidly evolving. 
Um, and so um, it's really, uh, you know, what I say today may, be, may not be true tomorrow. So, um, but uh, at least we'll, we'll try uh, to start with it. First, uh, just a quick introduction to the Conservation Finance Alliance. We are a global alliance of conservation finance practitioners and experts, and um, our mission is to promote awareness, expertise, and innovation in conservation finance globally. We've been around for about 20 years, around 3,000 members, including 40 institutional members. And we have different working groups. Um, the longest running has been environmental funds or conservation trust funds. We do work on innovation with an incubator. Um, we have a marine and coastal um, finance working group. And then we are support the sustainable finance specialist group as well. You can find information at conservationfinancealliance.org and of commercial. And um, so, Nature credits. Well, I call them nature credits to be a bit broader. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are saying biodiversity credits. There's, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the organizations involved here, but um, what's the sort of reason that this is interesting? Um, you know, nature provides us enormous amounts of services and very few of those can be monetized easily. It's, um, so it's, it's, you know, some people think that nature should pay for itself. Um, we recognize that that no, it's a public good. It's something that we all need. Um, and you know, as her chum was saying, you know, things are not looking good. We haven't been respecting nature. And so this so nature credits are one way to try to pay the stewards, let's say, of nature um, conservation um, for some of those ecosystem services that nature provides that are currently not being paid for. So that's that's one of the ideas. Um, just a reminder here how important um, the oceans and forests and, and, and life on the planet is to support society and the economy. It's basically the basis on which we we all, uh, the whole world depends. So we really ought to be investing in it um, significantly. So it'd be nice to get this, uh, to get this right and, um, and uh, create a more financial flow to support nature conservation. Um, I'd like to point out that they're not a nature credits are not a panacea. They're not going to solve the nature crisis. Um, they are just an additional source of financing to support, you know, the key role of communities, governments, and and private sector. Um, they they're already out there doing conservation. Governments play a key role in financing nature and, and creating the regulations and rules that uh, keep nature around. And private companies also need to reduce their impact. So, um, you know, one of the common themes with offsets, uh, with, with credits, sorry, is that they cannot be used as offsets. They cannot be used as an excuse to harm nature across, you know, all the different methodologies that are being uh, proposed. This is a really common theme that, that it's not something that, although there are biodiversity offsets, they exist. These are mostly through regulate, regulatory markets or, you know, required by banks and, and other financiers. So this is, um, and that's to offset the residual damage of planned impacts on nature. These are these are something additional to that um, and should not be uh, used. If they are used uh, to justify harm, harming nature, will be criticized right from the start and there'll be a, kind of a, a no-go in a way. Um, but that brings us to the question of then, who's gonna buy them if they're not for offsetting? And so hopefully we'll get into, into that in the discussion. Um, another common theme is that they should reflect um, justice and the central role of indigenous peoples and local communities as stewards. I think maybe you've heard over the last um, bit that about 80% of biodiversity is, is currently maintained by indigenous peoples and local communities. So we really need to make sure we support those groups in the, the conservation work they're doing. And then there's a whole range of other principles that, that are um, repeated across all the different players, integrity, science-based, you know, good govern governance. You need to have clear claims, obviously registries and third third party certification, things like that. And as I mentioned, it's a rapidly evolving field. There's a, a last estimate I heard is about 21 different methodologies being proposed. So a lot of, and you're gonna hear from some of the innovators today. So just to kind of structure us with, how do we think about these different methodologies, um, you know, the actual overall goals are, is conservation, but then within that, you know, you could have us focus on species. Um, you could, you know, think of more ecosystem functions. Oh, one more, one more sort of separation and, and framing 
piece is that nature is complicated. You know, carbon, it took them a long time to negotiate, you know, what the Framework Convention on Climate Change was going to track. There's all these committees. They, but they're really measuring one ton of CO2 equivalent. It's got a sing, singular unit, if you will, that everything kind of base, you know, matches up to. Whereas nature, no one's tried this before because nature is so complex and it's really hard. And so, again, I, I want to shout out to all those innovators that have tried this and have moved this forward because um, this is part of it. How do you quantify benefit to nature? So that's gonna be a, a theme that's gonna come back a bit. Um, so anyway, you have these overall goals. Um, it could you know, be around reducing threats or improving function, but mostly people are focusing on species and ecosystems um, and different measures. Um, there's all kinds of metrics um, and some uh, methodologies uh, have you know, fixed metrics, uh, uh, Plan Vivo, um, Pivotal, sort of, they have one uh, metric approach. Um, some of them are very flexible. Um, you know, a lot of interest is around high tech um, monitoring because, you know, we want to try to standardize and uniform. But then there's also issues of how do we make this accessible to, you know, local populations that don't have the money. We don't want to spend a huge amount of money in monitoring um, when we can have a, a more easy uh, implementation system. So issues there. And then another, you know, kind of difference among the approaches is, you know, how do you measure biodiversity change? Do you measure it over time, like the pivotal and um, plan vivo approach? Uh, are you measuring it relative to a counterfactual, what we expect, you know, compared to some sort of ideal? And then there's the stewardship versus change. Um, you know, the stewardship piece is how do you maintain um, nature? Um, uh, it, what, how do you maintain high biodiversity areas? Historically, climate um, uh, voluntary uh, uh, carbon markets have excluded areas that have not been under threat. Well, in biodiversity, we, we kind of want to conserve areas that are not under threat. But others would argue that, but if it's not under threat, why would we spend money on it? Why would we invest there? Is that a priority? Um, and so there's different approaches. Uh, there's a type of um, you know ma maintenance credit or stewardship credit that's being looked at by a range of people. And then a lot of other credits are really measuring or issuing credits based on change, change over baseline, change you know restoration and that kind of thing. So um, and there's the question of significance. Um, you know, are certain areas more valuable than others? Um, and again, some people are looking at well, areas under threat are more important. Others are looking at endangered species uh, as more important. Um, generally, you know, we have key biodiversity areas, we have other types of measures that, that you know, value different areas. We have the global biodiversity framework against which some um, groups are looking at. And then finally, um, question of claims, you know, um, if someone's gonna say this is all nature positive, it's not offsetting harms, um, you know, what claims can you make based on the different credits? Um, which are appropriate, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, this is just a, a kind of a, a graphic to show, you know, how ma maintenance, let's say, is a steady state. You know, do you issue credits um, by maintaining that steady state? Um, what if the, the counterfactual is decreasing and, and you're still decreasing biodiversity, but better than the counterfactual, um, better than, you know, business as usual, do you get credit for that? And then the green line is kind of about restoration, you know, you've got a, a baseline of either a counterfactual or just a maintenance, and then you're going to restore the areas and it's going to go up. And so do your credits, are they based on the difference between your starting point, like in the um, Plan Vivo approach, or do you, can you have a counterfactual and get credits based on the change over that? And of course, lots of uh, issues around um, counterfactuals um, these days. Um, so just to kind of close off here, um, this is just a very partial list of some of the, the key players here. I want to shout out to, to um, all of our panelists here who are really pioneers in the, in the field here. Um, and uh, But just to give you an idea, there's, all, there's different organizations working on this. WEF have task forces. There's a Biodiversity Credit Alliance, which was started. There's a new effort by um, the French and, and uh, UK governments. Some governments are also looking into this um, for more regulatory um, markets, the UK, you know, Australia, New Zealand, um, and just a couple of recent developments. And, and I'll, I will share this presentation um, with you all, hopefully. 
Um, so these are click through links, but here's the Plan Vivo's got a second version of their methodology together with Pivotal. Um, Vera now we're, is in public consultation and for disclosure, we're part of the, the framework development uh, team. So um, we're gonna be supporting that public consultation. Um, there's this international advisory panel on biodiversity credits, a relatively new group that I mentioned before, the Biodiversity Credit Alliance. Um, there's a new discussion paper out on community engagement. So there's quite a lot of, of recent work going on and I'll end there and thank you very much. Passing it back to you. Thank you, David. Um, Tim, we're going to go, we're, first of all, David, thank you so much. And we're gonna um, ask our questions to you afterwards. Uh, Tim, can you go next? We know that Tim has to leave a little bit early. So uh, Tim, present your presentation and then we might ask a few questions to you already just because we know you have to leave, that's all right. But go ahead. Can you, well, firstly, can you hear me and see me? And then secondly, can you see the screen? Because I can't for some reason, all of a sudden. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. And okay. And then I'll put it into two. Right, okay. Well, hello, everybody. So I'm, I'm Tim Cole, so I've spent my entire career, I'm afraid, in, in biodiversity monitoring, actually practically doing this in the field. Um, and uh, the, I'm currently the CEO for Replanet, which is an organisation that's developing 25 projects around the world to stack both carbon and biodiversity credits, and a whole series of those launched already. Okay, so firstly, you know, the, the, the big question is, Okay, there are 25, 29 different methods out there, actually, at the moment. But in, in the end, you've got to come down to what is a change of in, in unit of biodiversity. You know, we, we know what that ton of carbon dioxide is for carbon. But without an agreed unit of change for biodiversity, you're never really going to be able to scale this market. And so uh, we started uh, back in 2021 with a massive sort of consultation group to try and solve this particular problem. We got really stuck until we thought about the consumer price index, which is a basket of goods and services that we price up in, in each country, and we compare inflation rates around the world. But each country has a completely different basket of goods and services, and so they should, because that's what they're buying. So if you use that approach for, for high finance, why can't you use it for conservation? And so that was the approach that we took. We The idea was to look for at least five taxa um, that reflect the conservation objectives of what you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to protect a coral reef in Indonesia, then you're looking at things like rugosity, basically how many nooks and crannies you've got in it, uh, coral cover, species richness and, and, and abundance of herbivorous fish, same for piscivorous fish, species richness and abundance of, or, and, and biomass, sorry, of, of commercially exploited invertebrates. Now apply that to a lowland farm in southern England. Not one of those metrics works. We're not trying to improve coral cover on a lowland farm. They were looking at soil invertebrates and breeding birds, and etc. So essentially what you do is you select a basket of taxa, and the taxa is a, is a group of species, either functional like breeding birds or, or zoological like, like uh, butterflies. And you, do, you measure the entire taxa. So I'm, I'm very suspicious about using individual species because you could end up getting far too much variation in that. Essentially, what you do is you do, you, let's say you're doing breeding birds at a site. You're going to do your uh, common bird census. You've got to work out what uh, the different uh, bird species are there and you'll get a list of them. Not all bird species have the same value. Some are much more valuable than others because they've, they've got massive declines or they're rare. They're on a red list, in other words. So we grade each species according on a five point scale, according to conservation value. And that's still on red list. So if it's a red species, it's a five, it's an amber, it's a three, if it's a green, it's a one, etc. But when we come back, say two years later to remeasure, we're not just looking for changes in species richness. I mean, that's important, but great if you've got some extra ones, but we're much more interested in have we increased the abundance or biomass of the species that are at that site from at your first starting point. And for that, you therefore need to allocate a, a relative abundance value from one to five, with the most abundant being a five, one being the least abundant. You multiply your abundance by your important scores for each species. That gives you a figure for that species. Add up all the species, and that gives you a number for the value for your breeding birds at that site at time zero. When you come back again, 
two or three years later, remeasure. Hopefully it's gone up because you've done proper management. And if, it's, if it has gone up, then it will have gone up by a percentage from that baseline. But everything else will have changed as well. Soil invertebrates will have changed, total arthropods, higher plants, a better fauna, all of those will have changed by different percentages. So to get the overall improvement, you take the median value and you multiply that by hectares, and that gives you the, the units of biodiversity change uh, that you have at that site. Now, how do you get that independently verified? Well, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about um, the, the, the certification body approach at the moment, because you can't send someone into a field and say, OK, how has the biodiversity improved since the last time you were here? You're not going to be able to tell anything from that. And so the only way to do it is basically to have gigabytes worth of data that is sent to you that you work through. So that's a peer review, an academic peer review process. I mean, the whole of the science public publication industry is built on academic peer review. Why isn't it used for something like this? It's a very simple way of doing it. And Nottingham University in, in the UK, with a number of other universities around the world, has now formed a thing called the Biodiversity Futures Initiative, which... Uh, missing from your slide, David, I must send you the details about that one. But it, it's it's basically a way in which um, the, they can verify claims of biodiversity uplift. And so what they'll do is if you've got a project and you send them all their data, they'll ac different academics will go through each of the different metrics. They'll um, recalculate or check identifications, give you an overall number. So they say, OK, well, we agree. You have got a 40 percent uplift in uh, over a thousand hectares based on these uh, metrics or no you haven't you've cheated you've only got closer to a 20 percent uplift or no go away your surveys were so poor we couldn't actually assess it and so at the end of that they will then give you that uh, that certificate that certification claim so let's say you've succeeded you've got your 40 percent claim across your um thousand hectares they're not going to go any further than that though because that's the problem with carbon at the moment the carbon bodies uh, are incentivized to issue more credits um, because they get paid by the credits. So we want to break that link between the size of the claim and the issuance of the credits. And so the stage after that is you can stop at that stage and say, look, we're happy. We know how much of an uplift we've got. Uh, and we'll use that, for example, to, to quantify the co-benefits for carbon credits. But if they want to go on and monetize it, then the next thing they're going to have they, they do is they go to a body like Hedra or Bitgreen or SGS, basically a registry where they can issue 80 percent of their claim and they have to keep the other 20 percent of the buffer. And um, the other the other 80 percent can be issued as biodiversity credits. So you can have two stages. You can either use it as a as a way of quantifying the value of biodiversity for carbon, in which case you don't bother with the credits or you move right on to the credit stage and issue those credits. So um, the next uh, bit is, you know, doing it. Um, I, you know, with 29 different projects, different methods around the world, there is no way you'll get everyone to agree on how it works. I mean, the, the one thing, actually strange, the one thing that we all pretty well agree on is that a, a, bio, a change in biodiversity a unit of biodiversity is a change in the value of biodiversity per hectare. And that's as far as we go. Within that hides an awful lot of differences. And so how is it ever going to get resolved? Well, we think the only way it'll ever get resolved is just stick it on the market and see what happens. And so we have uh, 25 projects that uh, all around the world, so they're, they're things like mangrove restoration, riparian forest restoration, uh, rewilding of a Galapagos island. There's a Scottish island that's being completely rewilded. There's a whole series of these projects. There's UK-based projects, European projects, and they're all at least a million, usually about two million carbon and biodiversity credits. So if you're working in, in mangrove restoration, then about 90% of your income is going to come from carbon, and the other 10% comes from biodiversity, because whatever people say to you, mangroves are virtually a monoculture, so they're not going to be that diverse. But once you move into restoration of native forest, like we are in Panama and, and, and Costa Rica, for example, about 50% of the funding comes from uh, carbon and 50% from biodiversity. And the biodiversity credits really come into their own on what happens in open sea reserves, where you've got large areas where everyone's drawing a line on the map at the moment and saying this is going to be a new marine reserve for our Montreal target. How do you fund that? 
well, this is a perfect way using biodiversity credits. You do it, you payment by results. If you can double the fish populations by protecting it, you can issue biodiversity credits as a uh, and fund it that method. And then there's also the option of, you know, agriculture is the biggest impact on, on biodiversity uh, because it's the biggest land user of, on biodiversity. And a lot of the big food companies are now investing in their supply chains to, um, uh, to, to improve biodiversity, but they're not measuring it. So what, what, what else do you invest in and don't measure? Why not use something like the biodiversity credit methodology in order to invest in that? So we're talking to a, a number of very large food companies that are using this technique in order to quantify their uplift. And so how, how are they funded? Are we short of funding for this? Absolutely not. <laughs> we actually have the I'm a biologist. I've spent my life looking for tiny bits of money. The opposite is now happening. What we're finding is, is that there are large numbers of companies. We've sold stuff already to GlaxoSmithKline. We've got you know, a large bank investing in some, in some of our projects. We've, we've got a lot of impact funds that are investing. So we, we, we work actively with about 20 of these uh, for any project that we have available. And many of our projects have already uh, forward sold on this. And the reason that it's attractive is that if you're an investor, you can put in something like, let's say, three million to start a project. And that um, you get your funding back within five to seven years from, from the payments from the carbon and biodiversity credits. And you have an IRR of uh, 15 to 18 percent. I actually just spoke to one of the funders very recently who say, well, that's too high. We can do it for 13 percent, which is, you know, we're not going to quibble over that. The, the point is the funding is there for these projects. And it's a matter of just getting on and doing these things rather than talking about them endlessly and producing reports. And so we we have. Uh, as I say, 10 projects ready, market ready now. Most of the, oh, those are already forward sold and we're just going through the negotiations with the rest and there'll be another, uh, at least 10 by the end of November that are available. Anyway, I'll stop at that point and happy to answer questions later on. Thank you, Tim. So because you said you needed to leave early, we're just going to hijack our original plan with doing the Q&A afterwards and decide to just ask you right away before you have to leave. So also everyone who's, uh, yeah, all the attendees, if you have questions for Tim, now is the time. Um, do you want to go first, Isham? Yeah, I, I have one question. Uh, so I, I really think that the peer review method to verify results is, is very interesting. But I I'm just wondering if it could not be a bottleneck for projects. So I wonder uh, if if it would not be very time consuming for academics to verify results. Um, and uh, if um, the academic institutions could absorb all this work if we're going to upscale and if there would be a need of change for academic infrastructure to meet the demand. So basically, might it be a bottleneck? And um, uh, what needs to happen for this to work? Okay, well, f firstly, there's already a bottleneck. I, I mean, you try and get a carbon project through, it's gonna take you a couple of years from, from start to finish. The, the advantage of the, of the academic peer review is it removes that bottleneck. Now, remember, that's the system that's used for academic peer review for, for scientific publications. But for the most part, they don't pay academics to do that. That's a voluntary part of their job. What the difference that the Biodiversity Futures Initiative is doing is it pays academics and it pays them £500 a day to do this work. And you'd be surprised at how, how enthusiastic academics there are to work at that sort of rate of pay in order to do the, uh, the necessary work. So the target is the stage one review for this, which is where um, they, they, they analyse whether the um, the the metrics you've chosen are appropriate for the site. The methodologies are going to produce the results and the sampling strategy is appropriate. Uh, that's done within three weeks. And the stage two, which is where they pull apart all the data sets and recalculate and everything, is done in six weeks. That's up and running now. Today, you can put in an application for that and you will uh, should be able to, to meet that uh, uh, that target. You've gone, you've gone mute, Hajim. Go ahead. So this way of working with uh, academic peer review, um, would, would this fit in uh, in the different methodologies that are now being uh, produced by institutions like Vera and Plan Vivo? 
That, that's up to their own plan of evil. I mean, the, the facility is there for them to be able to use academic peer review, and they have to do some academic peer review anyway as, as part of their process. Um, but in general, it's just a couple of academics. It, it's the, the, the peer review group will be at least 100 strong. So since they opened it for applications around the world, they've been absolutely swamped. Um, and so it's now a matter of them thinning it down to get the, the 100 people that they're looking for with different skills, different expertise, from around the world. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I have, I have, a, I have a question. There are first of all, there are lots of questions for you also in the chat. So when yeah. we continue, Tim, um, feel free to answer them in the sorry the Q and A. Feel free to answer them. Just type them out. I had um, you know, I don't know very much about uh, this field, and I had a basic question, which is how do you get a uh, baseline, how do you measure the baseline of your taxa? Uh, well, exactly using the process I, I just described, you're sending uh, teams in to do to do that uh, monitoring, to, to get the data on the relative abundance and the you know, species richness of each of those groups. Now, what you do is you use modern techniques wherever you can. I mean, we use camera chat to use audio moths, et cetera, but you can't use them in all situations. I mean, a classic example is, is we did some work in, in Transylvania looking at a, a lot of very, very interesting habitats, but very different and very close together. And if you put in a, a, a span, if you put in an audio moth, what you do is you're picking up bird calls from you, goodness knows where. I mean, it can be 100, 200 meters away. In other words, a completely different habitat from the one you're monitoring. So it's, it's, not, a, a, it's not a sort of answer for absolutely every situation. <laughs> Uh, if you've got a large forest that you can stick audio moss in, perfect, that works. Same with camera traps. But it's a mix of using of using modern MRV techniques, but also traditional ecological skills. And that allows us to also massively improve the amount of work that's being done by, by local community members. A key feature of all of our projects are that 60% of the funding goes to local stakeholders, owners, users, managers. And that's not just at the issuance price. It's at the resale price. So if you if we produce blue carbon, which we do for fifteen dollars, um, and it gets resold for thirty dollars, it's no point saying, well, the communities have got sixty percent at the issuance price. They've only got thirty percent the final sale price. So we put a clause on all sales contracts that require sixty percent of any profits over the issuance price to be paid back to community members, and and that provides significant income to indigenous communities. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying this for me. Uh, Mariana, you had a question. Did you want to comment on something that Tim said? It says you have a, you, your hand is raised. Okay, then is it? It was just a technical error. That's fine. <laughs> but Isham, you have another question. Okay. You're on mute. Uh, Sorry. I mean, Sorry. There's, a, there's, a, there's one in here from, from Ignacio saying, uh, should we put a price on nature? Um, well, we do put a price on nature at the moment. Zero. It doesn't count. It mm. doesn't come into the equation. You, you know, it, that's the problem. It's because we haven't got a price on nature. Um, we, we're ignoring it when we're coming to making these economic decisions. Uh, and, you know, 70% of the world's economy is private sector. It's appalling that 70% of the solution to this biodiversity problem is in private sector. At the moment, I think the UNEP report, what, 26 billion being spent? From private sector on biodiversity, that was 17% of what's being spent. The vast bulk of the, you know, the, the, the workload is being done by governments and philanthropic organizations. You'll never scale to what you need unless you get private sector funding going. It's an absolutely essential part of the equation. Thank you. Uh, can I just answer a couple on, the, on there? Because how will yeah, I have one uh, question for you? Oh, okay. So um, from the 25 projects, um, will it go through uh, registries uh, with blockchain or are you more looking at uh, traditional certification bodies like Plan Vivo and Vera? No, we put, no. I mean, don't forget you don't need a certification body on this process because you've gone through your academic review. You've now got a claim that's been verified. So you're now looking for a registry that's then going to, to be able to um, issue those credits and retire those credits. So at the moment, we're using Bitgreen, but we're also looking to talk to Hedra and also SGS, it can be any of those that, that, that do that process. 
Thanks. And yes, Tim, go ahead. Um, you can ask, answer some of the questions in the chat. Okay, quickly, I'll, I'll go through them as quickly as I can. One about how do you consider diversity when selecting academics for peer review? Um, well, getting the gender balance right is, is crucial, obviously, but it's, it's equally important to get the distribution of those academics from around the world. We need people that are expert in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and Australia and New Zealand projects and so forth. So, so it's been deliberately looking, actively looking for leading experts, not just in taxa, but in different regions of the world. Um, the flow on I, the flow of benefits to IPLCs, um, well, I mentioned that's a 60% um, issuance. Uh, getting, you know, paying money to IPLCs is dead easy. The difficult bit is getting it spread, you know, because people have different levels of skills. And sometimes it's just that, you know, there's one family that's particularly skillful and they're, they're going to get more money than the rest of them. And so all of our projects, we spend a lot of money, unfortunately, on monitoring where the money goes to and how that gets shared out amongst the overall communities. So it's it's a big piece of work. There is actually, incidentally, another academic peer review body being formed that's doing precisely that. It's looking at how much money from each project is going, both carbon and biodiversity, is going into local communities and how that, that those funds are flowing. And, and they will then give an independent uh, peer review, um, you know, Claim, for example, yeah, okay, this project sixty-two percent has gone to local, is going to local communities under their budgets, and they've gone through free prior informed consent and all that sort of thing. Uh, do you see an issue around the permanence? Yes, because every project should be a minimum of twenty-five years in our view. Um, but then, what after that's not permanent. Twenty-five years is what what you get funding for from the project. What happens afterwards? Well, you've got to be able to demonstrate at the application stage that you're developing methods by which it is likely that that biodiversity will continue long after 25 years. That could be development of small businesses with local communities linked to the biodiversity. It could be um, development of protection areas so that they, they, they go into the conservation estate at, at the end of the 25 years. And that's quite popular with governments because that then gets it inside the NDC. So they, they get the common, the benefits from the, uh, from the carbon at that point. Maybe do one, do one last question. Yep. And the rest you can type out, maybe. And we will okay. go to the next presentation. No problem. Are there any more questions? And then we can... I think for now, it'd be good if we go uh, continue then. Um, what do, do you want to continue or, or, or let Mariana go? No, no, no. Let Mariana go. Sorry. Perfect. Okay, All right. Well, clear. nice to see you, Mariana. I'm sure I've got to shoot off because I've got another meeting. But thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Tim. Really. I'll put, I'll put some details on how people can contact me directly in the chat. Great. And if you do still see some questions in the chat that you can answer uh, in the next, I don't know, five minutes just that. by typing, yeah. that would be great. Perfect. Will do. Thank you, then. Thank you so much. Tim. Can I, can I uh, share? No, no, you're not sharing anymore. Oh, good. Perfect. Thanks, then. <laughs> <laughs> Mariana, uh, you're next. If you could share your slide, we know that it's very early for you. So thank you so much for still making it. No, oh, it's it's actually okay. Um, just we're good. Oh. Please confirm that you can see the slide. We can see your slide. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, first of all, good morning, everybody, for anybody on this part of the world. Good afternoon for people that are in the other part of the world and happy um, Friday. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of Terrazos. Terrazos is a Colombian company. Um, and we are, our mission and what we do is to generate, you know, exceptional conservation projects that protect threatened ecosystems. And when we talk about exceptional, what do we mean? Because this is kind of what has led us to work in, in the biodiversity credit space. We mean technically rigorous, financially sustainable, and socially and legally permanent. Right, so we always, so when we're looking to do work on the ground, um, those are the three lenses that we use to structure and to manage those projects. 
Um, I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, we are, we're a company that's on. So what we do and more broadly speaking, um, we work with companies to reduce their impact from biodiversity. We work with companies that need to compensate their impacts because they're required by law um, to do it. Um, and finally, we work and we develop business models that protect biodiversity. So when we talk about biodiversity credits, we're very much in this space of compensating and creating a business model that protects biodiversity. Um, our origin is very much in the compliance market for biodiversity compensation um, as it's required by law in Colombia. Um, so we, you know, about 10 years ago, we identified a need for high quality, again, technically rigorous, financially sustainable, legally permanent projects, um, because there were a lot of companies that were, that had to do compensation, but it's not their core business, right? They're doing transmission lines, they're doing road infrastructure, they're doing their operations, and that money wasn't landing in good places. So that's where we developed um, the model, which then became public policy. Um, and then we've been able now to in, enable eight different projects around the world. All of them are structured over 30 years. Some of these are, again, delivering compliance credit for mandatory compensation requirements and some of these projects are generating voluntary biodiversity credits for which we created kind of the methodology and the protocol that many of you already already are familiar with. Um, so just briefly, I'm gonna talk about what we've been doing on biodiversity credits on the voluntary space. Um, and in the end, you know, we're talking about biodiversity credits and that's the buzzword. But in the end, what it is, it's a pay for success mechanism. And it's a pay for success mechanism that results in positive and permanent contributions to biodiversity. So we can call it credits, we can call it certificates, we can call it pay for success. That's the bottom line. And I think that's what's really important in terms of um, how we focus our discussion. Um, in terms of demand, and I'm sure um, many of you already know this, but this is important to understand where the demand for biodiversity credit credit comes from. So again, as I mentioned, part of the demand comes from compliance markets. So what that means is companies that need to, that have environmental permits that are applying the mitigation hierarchy. And in that last step where they need to um, compensate their residual impacts, then they can compensate. Um, we're also seeing um, net gain requirements or performance standard six uh, requirements imposed by financial institutions, which is driving part of this demand. And then there's the whole set of voluntary demand that is very much being driven by CSR reporting standards, accounting standards, certification, interest groups. So a lot of um, you know product differentiation type of uh, approaches and then philanthropic. Um, a note a little bit about where we can why biodiversity credit um, credits makes sense. So this is a map on the left on priority areas for carbon markets. So these are blue and green are the areas that have very high um, carbon removal rates um, according to biomass per hectare. So if you're going to do a carbon project, you want to be focusing on those parts of of the country, right? Turns out threatened ecosystems and the most vulnerable ecosystems are where the red is on the right. Um, and that's where 70% of the population in the case of Colombia lives. So as you can see, you know, the carbon market doesn't solve the issue of um, promoting private investment in biodiversity conservation or in ecosystem conservation and restoration in those areas where there's um, low ecological integrity where, where you have population and where there's a lot of climate change vulnerability. 
So in, in this sense, biodiversity markets become complementary to carbon markets. And that's something that's really important, right? We're not, these aren't exclusive one another, they're complementary. Um, and that's the opportunity that we have. So all of our projects in, are in these areas that are in, in red. Um, and again, this, these are areas that are under critical threat status, according to the IUC. So, you know, what is the problem that we can address with biodiversity credits? Um, the reality is that we're going to see more private investment in conservation. Again, because we're going to see more compliance um, markets pushing the, this kind of investment or because the voluntary is going to kick in. It's not the it's not the business of many of these companies to do conservation and restoration work. So the chances of those projects going wrong if they do it directly is high. And this picture that you're seeing right now is an example of a biodiversity compensation bond. Um, and why in the end, many of these programs, um, when they're executed directly by companies, they're short-term conservation initiatives, they're dispersed, um, they're not result-oriented, and the end result, a lot of money is being wasted. So when you, when you introduce a pay-for-success mechanism, that is thinking about financial sustainability and permanence, you can address this, these issues in a way that facilitates investment um, and creates business models around biodiversity conservation. So the way that we approach the issue is um, through habitat banks. So all our conservation biodiversity projects are structured under this concept of a habitat bank where we're trying to go from disaggregated individual interventions by companies to strategically located areas that we um, identify based on technical, financial, and legal considerations. Um, project size can, our smallest project is 100 hectares, our largest project is 1,000 hectares. And this is really important because one of the things you know, in the carbon market, for example, if you're not working with a project that is um, larger than a thousand hectares, for example, for afforestation and restoration, you don't have you don't have a business case, right? Um, in the case of conservation projects related to red, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of hectares, um, or you know, at least twenty thousand hectares to make these projects viable. Um, in fragmented ecosystems, achieving those sizes is very difficult. Um, and 100 hectares or 400 hectares or 1,000 hectares is still extremely relevant for landscape connectivity. Um, so that's also another opportunity that biodiversity um, markets bring you know, to the table. So in the end, what's happening here is we're coming in, we're bringing in investment early on, we're setting up all the payments and all the crediting under a performance-based payment. So every credit that is issued in each habitat bank represents um, a milestone, an ecological, financial, and legal milestone that has been achieved. The land is secured for at least 30 years. We're reducing transaction costs for many of these you know, companies we're generating economy scale, and in the end, we're reducing financial risk and uncertainty for those companies um, that want to contribute to biodiversity. So, in the compliance in the compliance market, and this is how it started for us about seven years ago. Um, and one credit represents one hectare that is managed for thirty years, and that credit you know, includes all these things that need to be done in order to achieve the conservation. Okay, when we, when we, for us, for Terrazzo, the value proposition of 30 years is extremely important. So we needed to make, so when thinking about the voluntary credit space, um, 
we really wanted to maintain that. How do we make sure that that credit represents longevity, represents durability? But we also needed to think about willingness to pay, right? One hectare for 30 years um, can range, you know, in 10,000, you know, $10,000 is around the credit price. Um, so in the voluntary space, we need it. We really need to think about willingness to pay. Um, so we did an exercise. We did. Uh, we looked at many different things that could look similar to a voluntary credit. Um, you know, what's the average spending of a CSR department on an annual basis in, in terms of environmental programs? When we look at the adopt, you know, all these um, buy a hectare or donate you know, to the Jaguar or whatever, all these types of programs, what's the average price of these kinds of initiatives? And that led us to a, to a number, which is 10 square meters for 30 years. So, the, so our methodology um, and the crediting system in the end, it's, we're thinking again about smaller, you know, smaller size projects for these types of fragmented ecosystems. Um, which is oftentimes where the majority of people live. Um, but that credit still represents 30 years, right? So that credit is positive contributions to biodiversity in an area of at least 10 square meters. Um, I'm going to go very briefly around how the methodology works. Within a preserved or restored ecosystem that is managed technically, financially, and legally, for at least 30 years within the methodology you can be between 20 and 30 years. No project under 20 years is eligible um, for issuing biodiversity credits. And that project achieves measurable results in terms of biodiversity. And it's only when you achieve those results that you can actually issue your credit and sell. And these are some of the principles that have guided us. Um, they're the result of you know, the work that we've done on the ground for the last 10 years. But I want to focus on two of these principles. One that, that for us were very important. Applicability. Um, we wanted, we think that biodiversity credits are a tool to democratize biodiversity conservation. And that we could create a tool where the barrier to entry was not you know, the very advanced technical capacity of consultants and project developers, but, you know, the true willingness to be able to um, create projects that could be sustained in the future. So we wanted a methodology that was technically rigorous, but that could be easily adopted by people and organizations and companies that were already doing conservation projects on, on the ground. Um, so that's one element, um, even communities, you know, that are trying to develop and trying to figure out a way to make their conservation initiatives viable. And the other principle is complementary. One of the things that we've seen um, in other markets is, you know, the, 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 in the carbon space, for example, the voluntary carbon projects go in one direction, and then oftentimes the governments are talking in a different direction. And one of the one of the successes that we've had in the compliance market is that any time that we structure a habitat ban, because it's already regulated um, by the government, we need to demonstrate that the project is aligned with local, regional, and national. Uh, conservation goals and land use management um, plans and goals. Um, we think that's really important. We think it's really important that from the get go, we can talk about how these oftentimes private initiatives are really aligned with public interest. Um, so in the end, you know, these credits are representing permanent contributions, at least 10 square meters for 30 years, and it's all Um, the conceptual approach, um, we're using ecosystems as a proxy for biodiversity. So always, um, you know, the integrity of that ecosystem and see how it evolves with time in the project. 
And the methodology is divided in two parts. One is figuring out how many credits your project can issue. And then the other part is determining your performance milestones, which will allow you to um, release those credits in order to sell them. So how many credits my project can issue depends on kind of five factors. One is the area of the project, you know, the total total hectares. Um, and then once you have that, then it's what, how threatened the ecosystem is, um, how it contributes to landscape connectivity, um, the project duration. So if your project is 20 years, it will receive less points than if it's a 30 year project and the types of activities that are going to be done in the project. It's not, it doesn't cost the same, it doesn't create the same additionality if you're doing preservation, that if you're restoration and we wanted a methodology that could capture that. Um, this issue of activities is very much related to the to regional circumstances. So in the case of Colombia, for example, and those fragmented and very, yeah, those fragmented ecosystems, it's really important to preserve what you have, um, right? And also be able to restore areas. But there are other parts of the world where most of the preservation is already taken care of. It's very difficult to demonstrate preservation and you really want to focus on restoration. So as we... Mariana, I yeah. just, sorry that I just, I'm interrupting you. I just want to make sure that you know you need to wrap it up soon so we can also give Richard uh, a time to present. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah. that's, that's all. So, yeah. so that's something that needs to be taken care of. Um, so how does this land on the ground? This is one example. It's a um, project that has already issued credit. Um, it's a cloud forest, it's a threatened ecosystem. Um, it's very relevant for biodiversity, not only because where it's located, um, but also because of the endemism that it has. Um, and here it's just when you, the way that the methodology works is depending on the threatened category connectivity, temporal, the temporal, the duration and the preservation and the restoration, your project will be issued, will issue more or less credits. So this is an example, the maximum score that you can get is 100,000 credits in a project of 1,000 of 100 hectares. Um, minimum would be 60,000. And then if you have a variation of different factors, then this is, you know, what you would get. Um, and then finally, this is the release schedule. So based on, you know, in, in your project design, you need to define what those milestones are going to be, which need to be ecological, again, financial and legal. Um, and the assumption is that conservation is not just the result of achieving those milestones in terms of those ecological milestones, but there's certain management milestones that are critical. So when you, for example, limit land use, uh, because you've put in uh, an easement um, for 30 years. That's a huge conservation outcome, and it required a lot of effort in order to get there. So this allows you also to get some early cash flows in that are very significant to be able to ensure the success and the permanence of the project. Um, some of the, I'm not, but this is the type of indicators that you would use in order to measure that, the kinds of claims, where to report these outcomes and that's it so thank you um it was a very insightful and uh, detailed presentation thank you so much but Richard we're gonna go straight to you and I will kindly ask you if you can keep it as short as possible so that we can still have some time for the Q&A afterwards um so the pressure is a little bit on you now but uh I'll interrupt you anyways if we see we're going overboard and with time Right. No, I, I um okay, let's see if this works. Um so can you um see my slides? Great. Um okay, so um afternoon and morning to everyone. Thank you very much for having me today on, on, on this webinar. Um 
Um, I've been asked to talk about uh, wildlife credits. Um, I work in Namibia, um, have been since the 1990s, late 1990s, in the last 15 years for WWF, before that for local NGO, IRDNC. Um, and we support a program, a conservation program, um, that is legislated by the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, where rural communities can obtain rights to manage and unlock value from wildlife. Um, and um, one of our main visions um, as partners um, is, is to maximize the returns from wildlife to communities. And over the last 20, 25 years, once they become a legal entity and have that responsibility and that right, um, they have done this primarily through tourism and hunting, um, going into partnerships with private sector and generating a wildlife economy of around 10 million US dollars, which includes salaries, fees, and other in kind. And that's across an area of about uh, 16 million hectares, 20, 80 conservancies, rural community structures, um, that have been given these rights, representing about 200,000 people. So that's the context that we've been operating. Um, and about six or seven years ago, um, well, as a program, uh, we started thinking, when I say as a program, it's not just WWF, it's a partnership approach with our, with, with our NGOs and with our ministry. Um, how can we further unlock value and not be entirely dependent on hunting and tourism. And we recognize that hunting is under threat because of concerns about the eth eth ethical approach of hunting and, and killing game. Um, tourism, um, we've seen has come under threat with COVID with short time, short term, but also there's concerns in Africa, at least with a long haul tourism and the potential impact that might have on the industry. Um, so we came up with the idea of conservation performance payments. Um, we came up with the idea that the communities were, even with the tourism and the hunting, were not generating enough money to cover their costs um, that they incurred for, with wildlife. Um, we came up with the idea that there was already a lot of money out there whether it's through the tourism value chain, hunting value chain, or even other conservation agencies investing into conservation, but how much of it was actually getting to the wildlife stewards on the ground? And we felt that there was a tremendous amount of leakage there. And a lot of it was based on projects and investment and let's promise to try and do this or do that and increase the numbers or stable the numbers of wildlife or increase land that's been set aside or, or, or reduce the loss of land. Um, but what we thought was, could we not work with communities that are already putting their hands up and saying, we are setting land aside, we are looking after the wildlife. And if they can show performance that is independently verifiable, that they should be able to get payment directly as a result. Um, and we felt that they required it, they need it, they're not getting enough to cover the existing costs, there is funding out there, um, and, and also just to secure that wildlife economy um, um, and, and to compete against other livelihood um, uh, um, needs of, of the rural communities. Um, with this, this kind of galvanized us in getting these discussions going. Um, so what are the products we, we are talking about? Um, and we initially started with the iconic species, uh, species lions, um, elephants, um, rhinos, um, and and the and the idea was that some develop a metrics with the community, saying that if there are more sightings or if there's um, a greater presence in a particular area, um, they could uh, uh, generate a payment, and there'll be a contract in place with a central uh, conservation trust fund that has been established in Namibia for multiple reasons. One of them is for uh, conservation performance payments, um, and they enter into contracts with the communities. Um, they then follow up with the monitoring, and and then and if they can prove that there is a, agreed upon performance, payments can be generated. The main um, product there that we've moved on into is the conservation landscape or the wildlife landscapes. And, and here we've looked at two areas 
that communities are um, already working on or and managing. One are corridors, wildlife corridors, um, and, and the huge importance of that with the connectivity, but also the importance of it in reducing human wildlife uh, conflict um, and, and lessening that threat, as, as well as uh, securing the wildlife economy uh, as well. So they're very important beyond just the, the natural connectivity. And another important um, um, product uh, that communities are already um, um, managing is that out of that 16 million hectares, um, that have been set aside in Namibia, mainly against parks, uh, where Conservancy says we will look after the wildlife in this area, we will manage it. They've they've set aside around 4 million hectares um, for where they would not do any cropping and they would not do any settlement, and that this was primarily set aside for, for wildlife and the wildlife economy that goes with it. Um, and we believe that uh, that is a is a fantastic product where communities have basically committed set aside in that land has a management plan around it that if we could then come up with a product get a pricing right um, and then take it into the market there would be an appetite for that um, when we develop the products um, we we have taken a oh now, let me be short. I'll, I'll, I've, I've been, been asked to keep this short to give enough time to, to, to have further discussions. Um, what's really important um, for us is to get the institutional structures and governance in place. And so this is a, a, a kind of simplistic diagram of how wildlife credits in Namibia works. You have your communities that have been given, given a set of um, 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 camera traps or smart apps, um, and they're supported with uh, um, satellite imagery um, to monitor these different products. Um, and and we have worked together with um, our partners from the academic institution. We've worked with Deloitte Germany to, to bring all this information together in a meaningful way, in a dashboard way that, that can then very quickly determine if there's performance or not. And then that would also determine what the pricing is based on the arrangements in the contract. This dashboard is then provided to the Conservation Trust Fund, which in Namibia is Community Conservation Fund of Namibia. They have a review panel uh, made up of partners and the ministry to assess the performance and if it's aligned with the, uh, the, the, the contracts that have been put in place with the conservancies, payments are, are made. Um, the, the source of that funding has been grant funding primarily. It's been also corporate funding that wants to do socioeconomic, uh, uh, so sorry, um, corporate funding, um, social responsibility. We've had Distill with Amarula invest for corridors. We've had KFW make investment. We've had Line Recovery. It's bespoke funding where people have, I mean, institutions have invested in the conservation oh. fund. And I, we view that as a kind of primary source what the opportunity of the biodiversity credits in terms of unlocking the, the, the corporate component, we see that mainly as a refinancing mechanism to our primary source, and that we can hopefully package these products um, where we have shown performance and then take it into the, the market. Hopefully, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a, um, a concept, we're still working on it. Some of the game changes, the three more slides that um, are, are game changes for us. First of all is last year um, and, and the, the kind of announcement of not only the, the, um, the, 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 the 30 by 30 target, which is aligned entirely with what our conservancies yeah. are doing of setting aside land for biodiversity, but also the targets of financing setting aside this land. Um, and also reference to, to wildlife credits. So we see that as a real game changer for us. Um, the second one has been uh, the working with Deloitte and being able to scale um, technology so it doesn't just um, cover a few conservancies and a few corridors, but we can actually cover um, um, as many corridors as we want, as many um, hectares as we want, um, including all the four million, and to, in in a, in, a, in a constructive way, be able to bring all that data together and show performance. And then the third one is biodiversity credits, 
um, in terms of the market, the virtual market in tapping into um, into corporate financing. Um, and here we're working with with a partner called WhatApp, um, who and we've been working with them for the last five years in developing a, 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 how do we develop a product in a way that is trusted um, on a virtual platform for primarily the corporate market, but all any other market that would like to go through this con this open access uh, approach in, in in financing as opposed to a bespoke investment into the central uh, conservation fund um so um i won't go into that that's detail of how we do the pricing people can come back to me I spent a lot of time and complexity in trying to get the pricing so that it's um, both um, um understood both by our the communities as well as by, by the markets and 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 it's um which is not always an easy easy balance to make but in summary what we've tried to do is is to uh, transform uh, conservation financing for the wildlife stewards take it beyond hunting and, and tourism which is what they're primarily dependent on and to try and use public financing to secure public goods and then use the the markets that are coming up as a refinancing mechanism to continue that uh, payments and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. You're on mute. mute. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's clearly something, uh, I don't know, it's a pattern of today. But thank you so much for all the presentations. I think they were very interesting. Um, unfortunately, we only have 10 minutes left to go into the questions. Um, and the discussion, but we'll try our best to answer as many as possible. And I've seen that you guys have also been very active in answering the questions in the chat. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, yeah, lots of lots of lots of content. Isham, do you want to go and yeah. start with your first question, maybe? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. So my first question is for is for Richard. Um, so in the in the voluntary carbon market, re reliability is very important. There is a trust needed uh, of the quality of the credits for for the buyers. So I and 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 therefore they use uh, standards um, where projects are validated and monitoring reports are verified by uh, third party auditors, etc. And and I'm wondering. Um, how do you see this in your wildlife credit methodology? Um, and, and how do you ensure that the credits that you generate are reliable? Um, <clears throat> or sufficiently reliable for the market. So we haven't used a science approach um, because we find, feel that might be a little bit over the top. So the question is, how do we get the balance where we have a simplicity in place that's cost efficient, maximizes the return back to the community, but is also attractive to the market. And I suppose I've started from the other end, trying to get it as a simplistic or as a starting point, a simplistic product, um, a cost efficient, um, and see then how the market responds to that. Um, and I might be a bit too optimistic, but then I can ratch up then perhaps the demands as opposed to starting um, the other way. But the first point I'd like to also make is that we don't deal in credits. And I, and, and I should say that this is one of the big differences between the terminology of credits. The reason we've used the term credit is not as a product, a financial instrument, or even potentially a class asset that a corporate might need for whatever requirement for trading or put on a balance sheet or for what other offsetting purposes. Uh, we've used the word credit, and this was this was seven years ago. I wish I'd never had by now. Um, um, I wish I just used certificate. Um, we use the term of credit by giving communities credit, give them recognition of what they're doing and performing. And then our products are based on performance certificates, whether it is setting aside land and hectare and securing it or presence of wildlife species and so forth. In terms of the rigor, we absolutely understand it's got to hold, it's got to be able to be, um, be, be challenged. And, and, and therefore, we spent a lot of time working with WhatApp using um, blockchain methodology of being able to track the technology of camera traps, um, um, what apps, um, satellite imagery from source 
all the way up into the cloud. The details of it, uh, I don't know. I, that's why we're working with a partner to do that. It's their credibility on the line. It's their market, but they know it's absolutely vital that any product that gets put onto that market needs to be transparent at basically all the concepts behind the bi uh, bi uh, bi um, blockchain kind of concept. You can take it to source and you can rely on it. Uh, we're also building up audit processes along the along on route as well. So it's not all dependent on technology al alone, but there will be audits done both by us and by the communities on data that is being submitted through the camera traps through the um what's uh, uh, to, through the um um um, um app, uh, smart app and as, as as well as through the uh, uh um, um images um satellite images thank you thank you isham had one follow up question so i'm wondering um, also, are you now also building a platform to uh, sell these credits uh, to the markets yeah. or are you working on having direct purchase agreements with, with buyers that you know? Okay, so that, that the two platforms we've, we've developed, one is with Deloitte, which is a dashboard of bringing all this data together at, that can be done at scale. And that is provided to the conservation trust fund that we have. And it's up to them to go into the market now, whether it's KFW market, it's basically bespoke conservation financing. And we believe that there are going to be a lot of people interested in this. It's a much in terms of financing outcomes um, in conservation, as opposed to only depending on financing inputs, like always paying conservation agencies like ourselves. Why not also have investments where you can pay directly to the wildlife stewards? So we are looking at bespoke financing from KFWs, uh, and they have already, from corporates that don't necessarily need a class asset, don't necessarily need a financial instrument, don't necessarily need this as an offset. Um, um, but our trust in the in in the trust fund, trust in the product, and trust in the platform that we've developed with Deloitte. The second one is a platform that we're working with WhatsApp, which is a refinancing. Is that once these payments have been made um, through public financing uh, through the conservation fund, the conservation fund then is the one that engages with this platform. In this case, it's WhatsApp, but there's no reason why it can't be others to. Um, Put this data together in a way that it can then also be acceptable on on the market platform and that we are in the process of working with what app on and it's still being we, we still haven't got a final product thank you um just because of time i do have another question for richard and i will ask it and maybe you can just think about it and write it down later or send me the answer and i'll send it around but my question for you was I saw that you mentioned in your presentation that hunting and tourism is a big industry in uh, uh, Namibia. And um, my question was, what is the role for hunting in sustainable wildlife management? Maybe you can think about that uh, as we- That's go another webinar. Yeah, it's another <laughs> webinar. Um, a definite answer in five minutes, but I, I see that David hasn't said anything in a while. So I think we should go yes. and ask our questions to David. Well, I was going to say you should um, ask to Mariana because she's been doing this uh, longer than I have. And, uh, okay, we can also go and uh, ask our questions to Mariana. You had a few extra ones for her as well. Yes, I did. So I was interested. Well, one, one thing that I thought was very interesting is uh, that uh, biodiversity credits can also be generated in projects with smaller areas where in carbon projects we need larger areas. So I'm wondering why this is. Do you have, is it maybe because of a high press of the credit that you have or because of maybe low costs of the efforts that you need to make in a project? Um, great question. So, so I would say two things. One is we've made an effort to make sure that, the, that developing the project is um, is not as costly as you know some of the other um, carbon yeah carbon carbon project methodology. So it can cost between fifty you know fifty thousand to eighty thousand to put one of these projects together and get it to registration up to registration. 
Um, that's one. That's one thing. Um, and the other thing is that our credits are priced based on the cost of management. So this is it actually ties back to a question that there was about whether or not we're pricing nature. And I think, you know, we need to acknowledge that maintaining nature and recovering nature um, costs money. And we need to figure out a way in which we can finance that, finance that. So credit prices are based on those 30 years. It's the net present value of 30 years of management and doing everything. So in the end, what you're going to have, different projects are going to have different credit prices. Naturally speaking, a project that restoration might end up being, you know, the credits for that project will be, cost more than the credits for projects that um, might have another type of intervention or that the ecosystems might not be as difficult to intervene. Um, we think that it's very difficult to get around that reality. You know, it's not, um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mariana. Um, uh, but I see that we only have two minutes left and I have an important question also for David. Um, so in the in the voluntary carbon market space, space, we see a plethora of different standards and methodologies, mainly in Western countries. So it's it's total chaos, basically. So how do you see the future? uh for the, the the biodiversity credit market um would you see it also would would you prefer to have uh different very high quality standards but uh, uh, um limited in in number or do you see that there is space for uh other types of standards that are more, uh, less reliable so I'm, I'm just wondering how you see this evolving yeah, no, I mean, it's very pertinent the question. Um, what, what is happening is not necessarily what I would desire, um, but um, the, you know, I, I would like, you're asking what I'd like. I would like to see an overarching framework under which all of these methodologies um, can, can exist. Um, I don't think there's like one or two methodologies that are gonna win out because of nature is so complicated. Um, but I think we'll end up with the diversity of methodologies, each addressing different parts of nature. But I'd like to see a sort of overarching framework, a standard under which all the methodologies you know, agree. This is part of what the Biodiversity um, Credit Alliance is, is seeking to do. I'm not sure if that's the right organization to do it, but it's a, it's a good um, gr grouping of a lot of the early um, initiators in the space and the UN agencies. So, you know, well, it's it's gonna only time will tell, um, but um, but yeah, I think it's gonna end up being a diversity. At least I need I need two credits: one sort of ma maintenance stewardship certificates or whatever we're calling it, and then another one that's based on on change over time or over a baseline. Thanks, David. And uh, okay, so we're at three thirty sharp uh, Amsterdam time. So we will end the webinar, but um, we will keep track of all the questions that were asked in the chat and try to also answer them still. Maybe uh, we'll send them around to you guys. And if you guys are able to answer more questions, that'd be amazing. I just want to thank you so much for attending, uh, for speaking today and for presenting. It was very interesting for us, I think, and hopefully also for everyone else who joined. Um, we saw a lot of enthusiasm also in the chat. Uh, great presentations. Thank you so much. Uh, we will also share the recording to everyone. And um, maybe one last thing to announce is that Commandant is also organizing another webinar in or another event in a month's time on the 26th of October, where we we'll, where we will be launching our four turns guidebook that we recently uh, finished and published. And we're going to have an official uh, launch for that. And everyone here is also invited. Um, but yeah, that's it. Any last words? Or uh, thank you so much. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for hosting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.